back tonight with this first class. And uh, as you know from the syllabus that uh, uh, it is a study of the heart, the soul, and the mind and the strength of New Covenant Christianity. Uh, and that uh, it is uh, what life is all about. Uh, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And as you know, I always invite you to help me by reading uh, to save me from turning in the pages. And if you can see from the outline I submitted to you that you'll know where I'm going to go in my outline. Uh, it's well organized and you'll be able to follow each verse uh, in its uh, uh, logical continuity. And Deuteronomy 6, 5 uh, uh, will be the kickoff verse. The greatest commandment ever given in history. Somebody read it for us, please. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, whenever God, this is a covenant, and uh, whenever God makes a covenant with people, he always announces who he is. I am the Lord your God. I created you. Uh, with a mighty hand, I delivered you out of bondage. And these people knew what God could do. So in order to have this covenant uh, with God, we have to be challenged and motivated to what he did in his covenant. And uh, what God does to motivate us is say, I am the Lord your God, and I, with a mighty hand, delivered you. So uh, the covenant maker always dictates the terms of the covenant, predicated upon who he is, how strong he is, and what he can do for you. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the resurrection, I am the bread of life, I am the water of life, uh, I am the life that comes down, uh, I am the light of the world. What he's saying is, if I am all of these things, then what should you do? You should follow me. So the covenant maker always draws attention to his strength. And here's what he says, he wants you to love him with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, no, and all your might. All right, now, when Jesus picked up on this in the New Testament, uh, Jesus said, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and all of your soul, and all of your mind, and all of your strength. Uh, he said in the book of Matthew, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Uh, he said in the book of Luke and the book of Mark, he added strength to it. So the original text has what in it? Heart, soul, might, right? What does Jesus say? <coughs> what does he say? He added strength to so Jesus changes it, doesn't he? He doesn't say might. He says heart, soul, mind. Uh, now, as you know, man is a spirit creature. And I always put an X here. This is the spirit. This is the real person right here. Now, man has a soul. This is an apparition. It's kind of a glow. Everyone has kind of a glow to them. That's their soul. Uh, their souls are developed over a period of years. And uh, your soul that you develop, you're usually very proud of your soul. <coughs> you don't think much of your spirit, but you think a whole lot of your soul. <laughs> because your soul is your personality. In fact, uh, the word soul is translated person uh, or being. God breathed into the clay, the, the physical clay of Adam. He breathed, he inspirited him, their spirit coming into him, and uh, he became a living soul, uh, a person, a being. 
So what you are collectively is your spirit and soul, but your soul has a body over it. And of course, when people look at you, what do they see? From the outside, what do they see? They see your body. <laughs> uh, big bodies, little bodies, skinny bodies, fat bodies, uh, tall bodies, skinny, skinny, you know, short bodies, but that's all we see is bodies. But we do recognize that uh, everybody <laughs> is a soul, so we recognize him as a person too, don't we? Not just a body, but a person. Now, uh, but the spirit is the most important part of us. The spirit is the most complex part of us, but we neglect the spirit. Uh, we are a soul, but very seldom we ever talk about people being spiritual. Now the spirit is called also the heart. Uh, the spiritual heart. Uh, we think, we feel, we will, we have a conscience. Uh, our heart. Uh, and uh, of course when we think of the heart, we think of the physical heart that pumps blood through the body. But just as the physical heart is essential to our physical existence, the spiritual, we have a spirit that gives life to everything. The spirit is like a spark plug. It, it gives life to everything. Without the spirit, the heart would quit pumping. James said, without the spirit, the body is dead. Are you with me? The real you is your spirit, in other words. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The neglected you is your spirit. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The part that you neglect, and yet the part that is very real to demons and Satan is your spirit. You know, uh, uh, evil spirits are not souls. They're spirits. Okay? Uh, so Satan doesn't play games with you. Satan doesn't fool around. Satan goes right for your spirit. That's why they call them evil spirits, okay? And that part of you is going to be restless, it's going to be troubled, it's going to be sovereign, it's going to be disarrayed if it's not taken care of, okay? A neglected spirit is to your eternal peril. You've got to realize the spirit is the most important part of you. So through this series of classes that I'm going to be having, I'm going to be talking about your heart, your soul, your spirit. Now your heart and your spirit, out of the heart proceedeth everything. Your spiritual heart. So once your heart gets into anything, your soul and body will follow. If your heart is in. So your spiritual heart is the most important part of you. Now, how many of you go to your doctor and you say, uh, I want a spiritual cardiogram? <laughs> How many of you go to your doctor and say, I'm having spiritual heart troubles? Uh, he'd laugh at you. He'll say, my scalpel is not deep enough to do any kind of a bypass surgery on your spiritual heart. There's only one person that can do any surgery on your spiritual heart. And who is that person? Jesus. Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and ye shall... The Holy Spirit then has got to work in sync and pulsation and connection and compatibility with your spirit if you're ever going to have life. Now what do we usually turn to to get life, okay? Uh, we say, well, some other significant person is more important than the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, if I could just date this girl or date this boy or my husband would just behave a little bit better and be that Prince Charming, that Casanova that I know he can be, he should be. If my wife would just be sweeter and more lovable to me, uh, then I'd really be happy. Well, I'll tell you what, that's all superficial. I know it's important to you to have these significant people worshiping you and the ground you walk on, currying up to you and making you feel like that's, uh, you know, the king of the hill. But if you've got spiritual problems, you are in big trouble, and no individual can compensate for that spiritual void. Are you with me? Love the Lord your God with your spirit, your heart, and your soul, your person. Now, sometimes we work hard on our soul, trying to
to develop a better soul, so that our soul is more debonair, more flamboyant, you know, or bustling and bristling, and everybody likes us. But you know these people who are hustling and bustling and trying to impress you with their soul power, when they go to bed at night, they're torn with guilt and agony because, you see, their spirits are drained and neglected. And they're like a battery. They run down at the end of the day. And then they got to charge themselves up again. They run down at the end of the day. But when you have the Spirit, Jesus said, it bubbles over and you live. You live. You live. You got life. If you never want to die, listen to me. Paul says the body grows old, but what? The Spirit is renewed. Day. That's the most important verse I could ever think of. The body grows old. But your spirit is renewed dead. You've heard of the law of entropy. What is the law of entropy? Second law of thermodynamics. Okay, if you ever heard of John Lecture on the subject of Bible science, I'm sure you've heard of the second law of thermodynamics. I'm sure you've heard of the law of entropy. Everything's wearing down. Everything's getting old. It's all we can do to try to beautify everything, right? Everything we do, we have to maintain it, keep it from getting old and rusting away and dying out. It gets everything running down. That's, that's the second law, right? Except for one thing. There's one exception to the law of entry. And that's the Holy Spirit in your spirit. Your spirit is eternal. Your spirit will never die. And life in the spirit, living in the spirit, walking in the spirit of God, means that you are now eternal. Right now you're eternal even though your body's dying. That's why Jesus said, when you believe on me, he said, my sheep, they hear my voice. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. You know, a lot of people say, well, when I die, I'm going to get eternal life. Don't wait till you die. That's too long. <laughs> You've got to have eternal life now. How many of you have eternal life in your spirit right now? How many of you got it? Come on, raise your hand up high. How many of you really got it? But why don't you look like you got it now? Are you with me? You gotta show from your face what you got down in your spirit. You can't be Dollsville and not exciting. The most exciting people you can be around are spirit-filled, spirit-walking, spirit-living people. That's why Paul said, quench not the spirit. When you're down in the dumps and you look like a dill pickle, you look like a wart on a dill pickle, even worse than that. <laughs> that means that you are not renewing the Spirit of God. You're preaching the Spirit of God in your life. You see, the Spirit knows you have. Does the Spirit know you have problems? Huh? Does the Spirit know you have problems? Well, how does the Spirit act when you have problems? Remember, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You're a child of God, and the Spirit knows the mind of God. So the Spirit knows the future, the Spirit knows the past, the Spirit knows everything, right? So is the Spirit going to be all shook up when you have problems? Of course not. Why? How can the eternal Spirit get, 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 you know, spirits have been around since the beginning of, uh, of time. All evil spirits have. But the Holy Spirit's eternal, right? It's called the eternal Spirit. So since evil spirits have been around for about 6,000 years, you know, they're far inferior to the Holy Spirit, aren't they? So no matter what an evil spirit is doing to you, the Holy Spirit's eternal. He's not going to be shaken by that spirit because he's been observing those spirits, hasn't he, over a period of 6,000 years. He knows exactly how they operate. He knows how exactly how to defeat them. He knows exactly how to lift you out of the doldrums and put a smile back on your face every day of your life. So you need to live like you're in the spirit, act like you're in the spirit, and most of all, you've got to look like you're in the spirit. All right, now, love the Lord your God with all your heart, like your spiritual heart, and your soul. You're a person. A lot of people don't develop their souls for God. They develop them so their souls for themselves. They're soulish people. Now, they only develop the soul for themselves. Look at me. What did a man say when he said, I'm going to build bigger barns? And he said, and, and I, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to just fill those barns with wealth. And then after I've got all these retirement benefits, I'm going to retire with benefits and retire in ease. He said, I'm going to sit down and take my knees and eat, drink, and be merry. And I'm going to say to my what? I'm going to talk to what? My what? Who's he going to talk to? Who's he 
you're going to talk to? My soul. He's going to say, soul, soul. Why didn't he talk to his spirit? Why didn't he talk to his soul? Why didn't he talk to his spirit? Huh? Maybe he didn't have the Holy Spirit. He had, he had a spirit. No, the Bible, all people have a spirit. Remember. But he didn't have the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit of a man who knoweth the things of God. Uh, who knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit that is in him. And who knoweth the things of God, save the spirit that is in us. He knows the things of God. So the Holy Spirit and our spirit work together. Now this man had a spirit, but it was a human spirit. But he had a soul. His personality. Are you saying he told the soul because his conscious, his conscious thoughts take place in the soul? Right. He knew his spirit. He couldn't lie to his spirit. See? You can fool your soul. That's a reputation. You can allow people to, to establish a reputation by just telling you who you are. And you live up to that. And you've got to be what those people think you are. And you really educate your soul to be that way. But you can't fool your spirit because your spirit knows. That's why a lot of people who don't, who aren't saved, you know, uh, there's a uh, situation ethics, uh, existentialism, uh, egalitarianism. These are all fancy words that uh, that the philosophers use to justify guilt, sin, evil. Uh, you, you'll never hear the word sin or evil, or wicked at all in any uh, philosophy classroom other than in a derogatory, derisive, derisive way. Because they just don't believe that man is a sinner. They have developed their souls and they think they're okay. But now if they touch their spirit, then they start feeling guilty. Because your spirit knows who you really are. You can't believe. And yet here's a person, say they go to a class and they take philosophy and they say, ah, we've eradicated guilt, we have obliterated sin, uh, Satan went out in the 60s and hell went out in the 70s, it's all over with, we just eat and drink, we marry and he's going to be okay. So they lie. How do they feel when they lie? Well, there's no such thing as a lie, right? Say so they commit adultery. Well, everybody does it. Commit fornication. Everybody does it. Right? They cheat. Now we've been taught there's no guilt, no sin, okay, right? But in their honest to goodness moments behind closed doors, in the consequences and the conscience of their heart, they still have a spirit, don't they? You can't get away from it. I don't care if you're in Russia or you're a communist, you're going to feel guilt when you kill somebody. And the whole community, the public sentiment is going to turn against you. Okay? The guy's a womanizer. Why? Why? He's going to vote for Hillary Clinton, but he's a womanizer. Well, who cares if he's a womanizer? Bill Clinton's husband. Uh, uh, her husband's a womanizer, too. I mean, who cares? Well, what makes this for difference, does it make? These guys have been educated in a, in colleges that say it's no sin to, to do those kind of things. And yet, when it comes right down to the honest Here's a sinner calling another sinner a womanizer. They're both womanizers. You know, it takes a thief to know a thief, doesn't it? And they can't stand each other. You know who an alcoholic takes more than anybody in the world? Another alcoholic. That's right. They can't stand it. You can't fool your spirit. I don't care who you are. you got to live with that. That's why we Christians have a guilt-free life because we have the Holy Spirit, the blood of Christ, and we're the only people in the whole world can deal with our guilt and walk away with it, and God can say you're going to be okay. You're reconciled. That verse you quoted was 1 Corinthians 2.10. I okay. thought we ought to read that again. Okay, read it for us. Now God has revealed them to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the concerns of a man except the spirit of the man that is in him. In the same way, no one knows the concerns of God except the spirit of God. Yeah, now quote that verse, put it down. 1 Corinthians 2, 10. I've 11. been lecturing on that verse for the last 10 minutes. Powerful verse. So when you love God with all your heart, your 
spiritual heart, your soul. Now, there's nothing wrong with your soul as long as you admit that your soul must be developed by the Spirit. You're not in charge of developing your soul. The Spirit must develop your soul. I got a woman in my congregation, she's a very attractive woman. Uh, a lot of women who are attractive, they kind of dress in order to be suggestive. They flirt. But this woman is attractive. She's pretty on the inside, pretty on the outside. And when she dresses, she always dresses very appropriately. And I, 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 I complimented her on her, uh, on her clothes a couple uh, weeks ago. And she said, well, you know why I dress this way, don't you? And I said, why? She said, I remember you preaching a sermon. She said, when you women get dressed, you ought to always dress for Jesus. And she said, I always try to say, Jesus, are you pleased with my attire before I leave the house? Now, there's a woman who's walking in the spirit, isn't it? She's not in the soul. But if she's in the soul, then she would dress the way that the world wants her to dress. Are you with me? She'd be looking to Hollywood fashions and looking at the latest fashions, you know, and she would be suggestively dressing just like they would uh, on campus and a, a university, okay? So your heart, your soul, now your might. I looked that word might up in both the, the Hebrew, and then Jesus said your strength. I looked it up in the Greek. Both mean basically the same thing. It doesn't mean that we're strong, mighty people. What it means is the ability to hold on to something. That's what that means, might. Ability to hold on. I like that. I like that. The ability to hold on to something. That's what that word might mean. So if you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, you've got to love him with the holding on power. Remember, where do you get your strength from? From yourself? You get your strength from God. So. So you're holding on to God. Strength is receiving strength. Are you with me? It's important to understand that. Uh, Doug Hartman had a great sermon last Sunday. I, I, I really enjoyed some of his illustrations. One of them he used to, I'm not one for these uh, uh, illustrations to try to move people to become Christian, but I like an illustration where it is uh, a character building thing. And this guy out in California <laughs> uh, heard a rumble in the back of his plane. They were over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there was a rumble in the back of the plane, and the, uh, the co captain told him to go back and check it out. He went back there, and uh, the door was not locked properly. So he reached down to grab the handle and dust that little door across that door to fly open, and he went and smacked that out of the plane. <laughs> it was 400, uh, uh, 400, uh, thousand, uh, 4,000 feet over the ocean. And the plane was about 200 miles an hour. But fortunately, it wasn't a jet plane. It was a slow plane. <laughs> and and the, the guy, the pilot, said, oh, no, I lost my best friend. <laughs> and so he started like, we're making an emergency landing. <laughs> well, when they, when they got into the airport, <laughs> he got out of the plane. And there was his buddy holding on to that ladder, <laughs> that door. He had hung on to that until he got down to the ground. <laughs> he said, what on earth? You know, and he went back there and said, five minutes to fly, try his fist with him from the ladder arms. <laughs> I thought, man, that's when we ought to hold on to the Lord. The devil could never cry our, our hands loose from holding on. That's strength in the Lord. Amen? Hold on to the Lord. And he speaks of holding on to the Lord, by the way. And uh, uh, I thought that was a good illustration about what strength is. So, heart. So now the mind to me is not the brain. Uh, the mind to me, and I'm going to enlarge on that later on, I'm just giving you an introduction to the course tonight, uh, is Paul said you're either going to mind the things of the flesh or you're going to mind the things of the spirit. The mind, it, it, now there's a difference between the brain and the mind. The brain, of course, controls the neurological uh, nervous system. Uh, uh, man is composed of a, of a physical constitution, uh, the sinew, the muscles, the bones, uh, the blood vessel system, uh, all the respiratory system. Uh, I was playing uh, basketball the other day, and uh, 
I went out and I slipped on the ice, and all I did was put my left foot down and hit the ice and it slipped. So in order to justify myself from falling, I, I shifted my weight over to this right leg and I threw my back out, threw it completely out. So I'm walking around like this, you know. I mean, I was in bad shape from that. And uh, now, before I threw my back out, I could lift my leg up that high. Now I can only lift it up this high. <laughs> okay, no, I'm getting healed up now. I went to a chiropractor, and uh, uh, he fixed me up pretty good. But anyhow, <laughs> did he sing to you? But I got to thinking, just that, uh, uh, just that little jolt in my back caused the nerves in my leg to go out, and I couldn't hardly walk. I mean, I went from being a fairly strong man to being as weak as water. I mean, your body is a remarkable constitution. For that body to function, everything has to be working. You know what I mean? And for you to be a totally fulfilled person, to have harmony in the universe and harmony in your life, the purpose of these facts is that you might have harmony in your body, in your soul, in your spirit. Everything is <coughs> And you'll know when you throw something out, you want to know it's out of whack. There's a reason for it. Don't go around for a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you know. You know, the number one suicide profession is a psychiatrist. More psychiatrists commit suicide. In fact, one of my best psychiatrists who actually worked with me and some of my patients committed suicide uh, in, in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, the second uh, pr profession, uh, well, the second most suicide is among pregnant women. Pregnant women will commit suicide faster than anyone but, but psychiatrists. If you're a pregnant psychiatrist, you don't have a fighting chance. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, how are they going to shrink my head when they can't even shrink their own head? Are you with me? They don't have it together. They're stuck. I mean, you're sincere. I really believe they want to help you. But they just can't reach down deep enough into where you're living at in your spirit. Only the Spirit of God can get down there. And so your strength and your mind work together. Uh, your mind is not your brain. Your mind is that which gives direction to you as a soulish and spiritual entity. And your soul and your spirit answers to the spirit, whatever the spirit is in your mind, just like uh, your face answers to a mirror. So it's very important that you have the Holy Spirit working in order for you to function as a spiritual uh, harmony. <coughs> now, if we want to love the Lord our God, we have to have a, a good instructor. I want somebody to read uh, from uh, 1 John 4, 16 for me, please. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 John 4, 16, and, and remember, the quicker you read, the, the faster I can cover this material, but when I'm done with this tonight, I'm done with it forever. We have come to know. know. We have 1 John 4, 16. Kirk. We have come to know and have believed the love which God had has for us. God is love, and the love who abides, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. Okay, so... Uh, we got a mic here. Let's just pass the mic around. Each person take it and read. So we'll go ahead and give it to Robert here. This Robert Thomas. We'll just go ahead and pass the mic around. If you don't want to read, give it to the next person. One of the hardest, uh, the, the, the real reason why we have a hard time uh, loving is because we don't have a good role model. Uh, but in Ephesians 2 4, we have a very good instructor on the subject of agape love. If God said, Love me, that's a command. It's certainly because he loves us. And, and so God had to give us a demonstration. That's why John wrote this book of 1 John. He said, we need a demonstration of love. And, and, God, and God had to send his son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order to show love in a human body. So let's read Ephesians 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Keep reading. Even when we were dead in our transgressions and made alive together with Christ, 
by grace we have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Now think about that. In what condition were we when he loved us? Huh? We were dead. We were dead. Yeah. Now, now, you know, uh, the Bible said when someone dies, you got to bury them. Get them out of sight. It's hard to love a dead person. But if you could somehow appreciate that a person that you love is dead, and magnify that dead corpse and, and that rotten flesh. Magnify it a million times. And you just have a little picture of what God had to, to see when he loved us when we were dead. Being deaf in sin is worse than being deaf in a, in, in a, in a castle. Uh, I don't even know how to explain it. Loving someone who's dead. Yeah, just this past Sunday I was walking through the hallway and uh, and uh, one of my brothers came by, and I put my arm around him, and I hugged him. And he said, you know, you always hug me. He said, uh, every time you see me, you give me a hug. And he said, the first time I met you, I was working at Skanks, which is a, a packing process company, a food packing process company. And uh, he said, I just, I'm a nobody. He said, I'm just uh, pushing the, 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 uh, the loader around, and you come in there, and, and he waved at me and took my hand and said, what's your name? And I, I told him my name. And uh, I said, well, I'm here to get some stuff for the fish fry. We're going to have a fish fry next week. Uh, we're going to have a, an antique car show. We're going to have an antique car come to the church property. And, and I understand you have an antique car. And he said, yeah, how do you know? I said, well, your neighbor, uh, Hooper, told me all about it. And I said, I did not like to invite you to come out. Uh, he was just amazed. Out of clear blue sky. So he came to that fish fry. And, Started coming to church every Sunday after that. He had a lot of doctors that were really messed up. But little by little, he had to give up his doctors that he had embraced and to accept the, the doctors of the Word of God. And Doug Hartman has an old saying. He said, when, when people come out of denominationalism and, and cults and become New Testament Christians uh, in our congregation, they say, well, how does that happen? How can you take a person who's been a traditional uh, member of a denomination, and yet now they're, they, they've been given up the religion of their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, they've given up the religion of their girlfriends, their boyfriends, even their husbands and wives. They've given it up completely uh, and, and made this commitment. And, and I would say the reason that they do that is they know we love them. And when they know you love them, they'll listen to the doctrines of the faith. Did you hear what I said? If they know you love them, don't listen to them. If you don't love them, they turn you off. And you say, well, I'm telling you the truth. This is true. <laughs> and they're going to go to hell if they don't obey the truth. But the roadblock, the obstacle between them and them <coughs> is the fact that they don't think you love them enough to be worthy to tell them the truth. They say, you're just like me. You don't love. You see, love has to, Paul said, we're constrained by the love of God to warn people. <coughs> There's a constraint. Now, I, I wasn't, I got a long way to go in this matter of learning to love. And I wasn't raised with love. My, uh, my family was a hell-raising family. They played cards all night, you were in poker all night long, cuss and fight and drink beer. My dad was a prize fighter, a rough and tumble guy. I mean, he hit his own way. He loved me, but I didn't know what love was. And boy, God had a real waiting for me when I made up my mind I was going to be a preacher. He's going to give me a real crash course. I went to Kentucky Christian College, and he sent me into the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky, the poorest, poverty-stricken area in the United States at that day. Tobacco farmers working like it did in the feudal system back in New York. And uh, living off the land that somebody else owned. And I had to stay with them. And uh, I had to work with them. I had to eat their pork and beans and cornbread and onions. And for three years, God put me in that place for one reason. He said, you've got to learn to love preacher. I thought I was somebody at that time. But boy, I found out I'm a nobody. When I went down there, I was a nobody. For three years, absolutely a nobody. 
I went to Olympia. I had two churches. One of them was Valley Hall, one of them was Olympia. The railroad uh, tracks came right through the center of the town. And uh, only one guy kept that church going, a little country church. The name was Schwartz. And uh, he kept it going. He'd feed me every Sunday afternoon because I didn't have enough money to eat. They gave me $15 when I started preaching. 15 one dollar bills first day I preached one. I preached there for three years. And you know what I got at the end of those three years? I got 15 one dollar bills. That's what I got. Never got a raise, never got anything, just goodbye. Nice to have, you know? Now, I can't say I didn't do something good. I baptized some people. But when I ever go across that railroad track, to go to Crawley's house for dinner, man, faithfully, those guys met there. They had their beer. And they were playing cards right on the railroad track, right in the center of the town. And they had the audacity to call it Sunday school every Sunday afternoon. And Charlie said, now, I'm going to warn you about those guys down there. He said, they are mean hombres. They are mean guys. So you've got to watch when you're around them, you know. And I said, well, I've got to walk right like past them every time I come down to your house to eat. He said, well, be careful. He said, walk on the other side of the track. He said, you don't know where you're going to. He said, this is fast week. The guy was found dead down there. Got run over by the train. That's why I said, well, poor guy got away from the train. Yeah, but he had a hole in his head. <laughs> 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 so, so, I, 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 first thing, I said, I got to encounter these guys. I've got to figure out a way. I, this, this is going to be a problem with my ministry. I got to figure out how to work through these guys. So, I said, God, give me mercy. And I was fighting the prime of my Christ like days, and I said, I don't want to have to fight anybody, that's for sure. So I said, just give me mercy. So I walked across the railroad tracks, you know, and old Jim Hart looked over at me and said, well, here comes the preacher boys. <laughs> he said, oh, the preacher boys. He said, come on over and have something to school with us. And I said, no thanks. He said, well, you want to shake hands then? He took me by the hand. He's a big old burly guy. And he started squeezing my hand. They wanted to make a fool out of him in front of these guys. Well, I was a lot stronger than I am now, so I started squeezing his hand on the back of him. And he looked me in the eye and he kept right on squeezing. And I looked him in the eye and I kept right on squeezing. And we were locked, I would say, for about 10 minutes, just trying to see who's going to put the other guy down. After about 10 minutes, I felt his knuckles begin to crack. And I knew his hand was getting smaller and smaller in my hand. I knew it was just a matter of minutes. He was going to be down on his, on his knees. And I looked him in the eye. And they pushed her to his face and I said, I'm not going to embarrass you with one of your friends. Mm -hmm. And I didn't lose my hand. <laughs> Made an impact on him. He wasn't used to that. So, he had to put his beer behind his back. He had it out like that. He put his left hand behind his back with his beer. Put his hand back up to me. He said, this is the first time I ever had my hand in the hand of the Lord. The other hand in the hand of the devil. That time, two weeks later, the Christ. One of the best church members I ever had. But that was just the beginning. There was a woman in town. They said, you got to go see her. She said, went over there. She had five kids running around. She had an old shack. It was cold in the winter time, and uh, so she tore all the uh, and we're going to burn wood in her wood stove. She was tearing the siding off the house and putting a cardboard box in its place. I said, "Man, I made fifteen bucks a week, and I would give her three or four bucks just to try to get fuel for her stove." She had five kids. I didn't know she was a prostitute. I had no idea. I mean, everybody knew she was a prostitute. I didn't know what a prostitute was. That was pretty naive back then. Say. So I packed her in the front seat, five <laughs> kids in the back, my old Chevy Cooper driver to church to Sunday school, and everybody kind of looked at me. <laughs> I had no idea what the time of the town was. <laughs> and uh, uh, here they were. Uh, here they were. <laughs> The, the state was paying her so much money to have babies. Every time she'd get a baby, she'd get a check from the state. So she just kept having babies, you know. Well, I'll tell you what. That woman changed over a period of years, three years I was there. Got those kids dressed up. Got herself a job. Started working. Finally, she met a man that loved her. Loved those kids. One of those kids went to Bible college. When I first met them, it, the stench was so bad. We got on a hot day, it was all I could do. 
to make it from her house to the church without being overcome with the fumes of the, of the stench of their house. But after she heard the gospel for a few years, her house began to change, her neighborhood began to change, the stench even went away. And man, when I thought about God, love and made when I was dead, right? Jim Hart was dead, wasn't he? In sin, because of that. Sadie was her name, she was dead. And say the trust that. And this guy that I met, even though he was more respectable, had a good job, was dead. Said trust that. And now, after seven years, I met him in the hallway with my arm around him. He said, You know, you love me. When you met me down at Stamps, and you still love me, he said, The thing that kept me coming back to this church is you love a guy out of here. I'm telling you, brother and sister. Everything starts with love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Father, we thank you for this first time. Uh, the instructor. We have a great instructor. And that is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if you're if you're encountering an obstacle somebody, this love of God is also going to help you overcome. I want you to read Romans 8, 35. Now, when you read this, when you read this, I want you to notice the two the two great numbers in the Bible. I teach numerology in Hermeneutics, and. Uh, the number 10 is completion, the number 7 is perfection. Some people say, well, number 10 is perfect too, but uh, John Davis, uh, Bullinger, uh, most of them, uh, uh, Edwin Smith, they, they teach that uh, in order to make a distinction between the number 10 and the number 7, even though they're complete numbers, number 7 generally is the one that, 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 that retains the distinction of being the perfect number. So we have <coughs> seven and we have ten. And then you're going to see these numbers play out all through Scripture. When you start looking at numerology, you're going to see the perfection, the absolute masterful perfection of the Word of God <coughs> when it comes to numerology. And uh, here's, a, here's an example of one out of a million. There's millions of other examples just like this. But there's a number <coughs> seven and a number ten, took them in 17. In Romans 8, 35 to 39. So, somebody please read that for me. Who has the mic? I've got it. Okay. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, now, now let's go real slow on this, okay? Who will separate us from the love of Christ, okay? <coughs> All right, good. Read the first thing. Will tribulation? All right. Or distress? All right. Two. Or persecution? Three. Or famine? Four. Or nakedness, five. Or pearl, or six. Or sword, seven. Notice, there's your seven. Right? Now that's perfection. Uh, and, and in some way, somehow, your life is affected uh, by these things. Uh, you've got tribulation. You're being afflicted by somebody. Uh, you're, you've got distress. Now, what happens when you have distress? Okay. You're separated. Your spirit breaks down. Uh, you know, they, if you uh, take a, a bottle of alcohol, uh, it'll say on there, spirits. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, pharmacy costs now, uh, the use of drugs. Now, we have a pharmacist here, and, and, and the use of drugs is remarkable can do with legal beneficial drugs. But those same drugs can be what? They can be a huge sample. Okay. So when we have distress, we have a tendency to turn to substance abuse. Okay. But what's he saying here? He's saying, what can separate you from the love of God? What? That distress you're having shouldn't drive you away. 
You've not been trained right. You've not been educated right. You've got the wrong program. And once you're programmed in spirit to go downhill, which way are you going to go? The minute you have the stress, you're going to go tail fast, okay? And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later on in my third lesson here. But right now, the stress. Who's next? Persecution. Anybody here ever had a persecution tape? <coughs> uh, uh, Fine. There are truckers on the highway right now on their uh, CBs and, and uh, uh, on their uh, intercom uh, systems, whatever they might be, they're cussing and complaining to the high heavens right now. Why? Why are truckers complaining to the high heavens? Lost the diesel. <coughs> they're going bankrupt. $3.50 for a gallon of diesel fuel. Man, it used to be diesel was cheaper than, uh, than regular gas. But uh, but if you have the love of God, are you going to cuss and complain all the way down the highway after you've got gas or diesel fuel? No. You're going to say, okay. Yes, sir. Walk away from it. The love of God is greater than uh, your family. Uh, nakedness. Uh, you know, uh, nowadays, we have more clothes than we know what to wear. Uh, I got a, a, a sister-in-law who's a close fanatic, and every time we go to Florida to visit her, she winds up at the Kidney Foundation, she winds up at the, uh, the dollar store, she winds up at the Salvation Army, and they buy these clothes for two or three dollars, you know. And you got so many clothes, you don't know what to do with them. But back in those days, people couldn't afford clothes. They didn't have clothes. Naked, this was an important thing. In fact, back in the history of America, James Garfield, <coughs> when, uh, he was a Christian church preacher, <coughs> Uh, they called him the preacher and became president of the United States, but when he was preaching evangelistic meetings, uh, I would read one of his memoirs. Uh, I, I like to read the, 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 the bibliographies of a famous men, and especially James Garfield. Uh, he said, I went preaching in Sandusky, Ohio, and he said, I came home so happy. He said, they gave me $10, they gave me a slide of ham, and one of the women in the church made me a new suit. That's how hard it was to come across clothes back in those days. And he was bragging in <coughs> high heaven because a woman in the church made him a new suit. So nakedness. Peril. That, that, uh, that means that uh, you're in a dilemma. You don't know where to turn or, or sword. It, you know, I just don't know what it would be like to uh, be over in Afghanistan or over in uh, Baghdad or somewhere and be captured as a preacher and then have a guy pull out a, a steak knife and say, if you don't recant, uh, we're going to make you squirm and start cutting on your, not, uh, your neck with a, with, a, with a steak knife until they cut your head off. Uh, there's preachers who've gone through that. Two Korean preachers in uh, uh, Kim's church were, were killed that way just three or four months ago uh, in, uh, uh, for preaching the gospel in Afghanistan. And, but, but did that separate them from the love of God? Can I die with dignity if that happens to me? Can you die with dignity if that happens to you? Would you deny Christ? Or would that sword separate you from the love you have to God? Now notice he breaks with those seven things. There's a definite break there. He, now, now you think that Paul was educated in numerology and he said, I've got to give you seven things and then I've got to take a break? You think, he, you think he knew that, or you think the Holy Spirit was right now? Okay. So he gave us the perfect number first. He didn't give the ten first. He gave the seven first, okay? Now I take some break. Now read the rest of it, my brother. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we <coughs> overwhelmingly conquer through him. Okay. Us. Now that notice that, that that's an interlude. An interlude is a, a, an intermission. He said, I've given you seven things you can't separate you from the love of God. Now I'm going to take a break. Now I'm going to give you ten more. Maybe a total number of seventeen. Seventeen reasons why you do not have <laughs> any problem. I'm going to give you 17 reasons, and I can preach on that. All oh, I can preach 17 sermons on each one of these things to show you that you do not have any problem. You're going to be a Christian the day you die. There's no one going to take you away from God if these 17 things 
can be overcome by the love of God through Christ. Now let's read with those seven <coughs> in the next ten on. Verse 38, read. For I am convinced that neither death, one, nor life, two, nor angels, three, nor principality, four, nor things present. What? How about powers? Powers. Well, you're going to have the whole 17 if you do that. Four things present. <laughs> <laughs> Let's read it again now. We've got to get it right here. We come out for the 17, and I tell you what, Paul made a horrible mistake. Can't have one mistake in the Bible. There's got to be 17 for it to be perfect, okay? So let's start all over again. Verse 38 again. For I am convinced that neither death, one, nor, nor life, two, nor angels, three, nor principalities, four, nor things present. Five. It's in the same order. Well, maybe there are big powers after that. Keep going. Fires isn't in there, huh? Yes. Did he say fires? No. Yeah. It's in a different order. Oh, okay. It's okay. in there. Numeric standard. Okay, it's a different order then, right? Okay. Yes, All right, now we're up to seven. Okay, then we're at verse 39. <laughs> nor height. Right. Nor depth. Right. Nor any other created thing. Okay, seven, eight, nine, ten. Will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, I want you to forgive me for doubting <laughs> your ability to read that power in there. So. <laughs> Okay, I didn't, uh, I'm reading from the uh, New King James. Yeah, New King James Version. All right. Now, 17 reasons there why that you can go to bed tonight, put your head down on a pillow, and sleep like a baby. I don't care what has happened to you today. Did you hear that? You know, they say that one of the reasons why that you have physical problems is you have emotional problems. Uh, it's amazing that they, the, the, the things that can happen to you, uh, blood pressure, xemia, warts, hives, hiccups, constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, itching when you're not scratching, <laughs> nervous kidney, nervous heart, nervous gallbladder, zemia, hiccups, colitis, yeah, all kinds of stuff. GERD. Right, they call them psychosomatic diseases. You acid, know that? You go to the doctor, you say you got a psychosomatic problem. Acid reflux. <laughs> you right? <laughs> yeah, and then if you go to bed at night, you can't sleep, you melt yourself to death. Can't digest your food. You got saliva in your stomach, acid, and all kinds of stuff because your body's not functioning right. Your body is not being relieved of the tension that's built up in you because one of those 17 things that gives you down and you don't love God the way you should. And you got to love God all day long and you sleep all night long. Now you say, Preacher D, you don't have any problems. You got it made. Uh -uh, I'm married. <laughs> I know what it is to have problems. But I also know what it is to find relief. And I make a beeline. You've got to make a beeline to that 17. Read those things out and find one of those things in that list. And you say, God, you promised me that your love is greater than this. And I'm more than a conqueror. I'm not just a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. So him who loved us. Okay, now, uh, let's move on real quickly. Humility and service. Man, humble, humble people. John 13, 1 through 3, my favorite verse. I love it. I love that verse. John 13, 1 through 3. Come on, read it to me, please. Great, great passage. This is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Savior of the world, Creator of the world. Now Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world. Okay, now he's going to leave the world, isn't he? He's going to walk away from the greatest ministry he ever had, the man he loves the most, right? And he should be thinking of himself, too. He's going to be executed, isn't he? He should be thinking of himself. He's going to go to jail, you know? And every time I turn around, I want to take a 
a, a prostate cancer biopsy on me. Because my PSA is always high. Every time I go in there, my PSA is high. I said, well, I just had a biopsy. You said I don't have cancer. They said, we want to have another one. I said, I'm getting tired of you sticking needles in there. Okay? Are you trying to stare at your dad, you know? But, you know, I got work to do. I want to serve you guys. I want to serve Jesus. I want to serve 50 Kingdom College. I, I, I want to love people to the day I die, okay? I haven't got time to really get prostate cancer, you know? So uh, I got to find out a way or something to come in the PSA to go hide in me. I don't know what it is, but I'm tired of sticking needles in me, okay? So I'm just going to tell them I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But I know one thing I'm going to do, whether I die or not, is I'm going to serve the Lord to the day I die, okay? I'm not going to. The day I come serving the Lord is the day I die before I die. Remember Paul Bryant, the coach of down there in Georgia? Uh, Alabama, Paul Bryant, coach down there, great coach for years and years and years and years, about 80 some years old. Said, I'm a coach the day I die. His wife talked him into retiring. He retired from coaching. He wanted to coach the day he died, but he retired from coaching, and six weeks later he died. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've got to be active. You can't retire from this business. Jesus could have retired, but what, what was he thinking about when he was facing the rock, leaving that church on? To the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Okay, isn't that something? He loved them how long? To the end. Man, can you do that? Can you love each other to the end? Come on now, can you love that grouchy, crotchety guy in this church to the end? Can you love that gossiping sister of yours to the end? Come on now, can you? You know how we can tell if you love them or not? The frown on your face when you look at them, okay? I'm sure if you can love to the end, this is the verse. What's he do now? What did he do? Okay. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. Okay, so he's going to take us out. Now, a lot of people say you need to practice this in the church today. But nobody practices it the way that they, 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 they. Jesus didn't say, you got to wash feet. He said, do as I have done. What's the difference between the between saying, do like I have done and do as I have done? What's the difference? It's a simile. He said, I'll give you an example. You got to wash out of speech as an example. In other words, every time that you offer somebody a gesture of love, you're washing their feet. There's no way you can practice washing feet today, anyhow. You, you wash both of their feet. Today, they only take off their shoe and wash feet. One foot. But Jesus took off his garment. He stripped and put a towel around him. So there's no way you can practice this today. And that day was a perfectly acceptable way of behavior. And it was with men, not women. So there's no way in the world that this is a, a ceremony that Jesus is inaugurating in the church has got to walk feet. Some churches do that. And they're missing the whole point. We have got to condescend and love people that are unlovely to the place that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wash dirty feet, the most menial servitude that a slave could ever perform and to wash the dirty feet of a visitor. And this is Jesus. <laughs> All right, now I got a red. I got a red here. I have a time really to go into a lot of it, but let's go down to number two. We have to be good students. We have a good instructor, Jesus. Now we have to be good uh, students. Colossians 3:14. Read that for me. Beyond all things, full of love which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, what's that mean? Well, uh, it's a picture of dress. Like when I got ready to come down here, I took a shower, I shaved, uh, I went in to pick out a tie and a shirt, and the last thing that I put on was my belt. That's the last thing you always put on is your belt. For a woman, the last thing she do is she might put on a lipstick. She's cramped and got her hair all up, put on it. The last thing you do before you go out into this world, you got to put on love. That's always the last thing. Remember. Don't go into the world lovelessly. You've got to make sure that you're loving. 
And you say, well, preacher, you told me that last week. I'll tell you again this week. Why is there so much in the Bible that you've got to love? Why? Why? It's hard to do. It's not ordinary. The human race is not educated nor taught to love. Only the Spirit of God in us can overcome these prejudices we have to make us to love. <coughs> now, uh, uh, another thing is the extra mile. Uh, let me say this. There's two places where love is the hardest to bestow on people, for us. There's two places that is very, very hard to love. <coughs> what are those two places? The greatest thing, the greatest obstacles there are for us to love. What are they? Pride. Well, we can guess at it, but let's see what the Bible says. Okay. No, okay, let's, let's take a look at it here. Ephesians 5.25. Hardest place in the world to love. Right there. Ephesians 5.25. I know you've never heard it before. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives uh -oh. Christ loved the church <laughs> and gave himself up for her. That's hard. Hard. He wouldn't have commanded you. He'd say, well, I just take it for granted. Hard for a man to love his wife. To, to love her consistently and to love her sacrificially and to love her compassionately with a role model like Jesus as Christ loved the church. He should want his wife to be a Christian. He should never marry a woman unless she's a Christian because you can't love her as Christ loved the church if she doesn't know who Christ is. Therefore, you've got to make up your mind in marriage that you're going out. That lady you now says that the wife has got to respect her husband. That's hard to do. Why doesn't it tell the woman to love her husband? It tells the husband to love the wife, but why doesn't it tell the wife to love the husband in this verse? What should the husband do? Now, what should the wife do? Move back a few verses. What, what's her job to do? Uh, okay. And reverence. Why, why, why is a woman told to do that? He's the head. Okay. 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 But, you know, women can love a husband easily, but they have a hard time respecting him. There's something about a woman that she has to earn the respect of a man all the time. So a man has a hard time loving his wife. Now, uh, there's three kinds of love. Uh, there's eros love, there's philetto love, and there's agape love. <coughs> They're all three different viewpoints of love. For instance, if I love you eros, I say, I love you because I need you. I'll do whatever I, I can do to get you, because it's an erotic love. If I love you philetto, it's an affectionate love for you, I say, I love you because we need each other. And we can walk together in life. But if I love you about that, hey, that's God's love. That's the highest form of love there is. I love you because you need me. And I don't care if you love me back. I don't care if you treat me right or not. I'm still going to love you because you need me. Now, if that's the kind of love of God holds up as the ideal. This is the kind of love that we're, we're seeing here. That a man loves his wife. And uh, uh, that's a very hard thing to do because... Uh, there's one reason why it's hard, and I also say this in Romans 12 10, the second hardest group of people to live is love is in Romans 12 10. Read that for us. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Okay, so who's this love for? Who's this love for? Yeah. Who are these people we're supposed to love? That's the problem. We are we, you, you gotta love me, you're a preacher, you gotta love Larry, you're a preacher, you gotta love John, you're a preacher, you gotta love Brother Thomas, your brother Retro, your elder, you gotta love uh, your, your your brothers and sisters to sing with you every Sunday. Uh, in those two areas, in the family, spouse love, and in the church, brethren love are the two hardest places, and there's one reason why that's the hardest challenge anybody in this world to do. One reason. That's why God opened those things up. And what is that one reason? I, I can guess, but you're going to tell me I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> because it requires a lifetime devotion. Okay, it's a lifetime. Okay. 
Okay, it's not a short-term arrangement. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for, but it's a good answer. I'll give you credit for that. It's a good, good answer because it's not a short-term. I mean, you don't get married and say, "Well, when we have a fight, we're going to break up." You know? Uh, we're not very protective or smart because we can't afford to pay our bills, you know. Okay. Now, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. I'm not, it's a psychological answer here. I was thinking rebellion. Just the rebellion that's built in. Say it again. Rebellion. God said it, so that's the two hardest things to do. Okay, okay. It, 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 I would say it's a byproduct of what I'm looking for. Rebellion. Satan don't force the love. Where you at? Okay, okay Bert. Okay. So Satan doesn't force the love. Okay. How about conditional? How about pride? People tend to love conditionally, not unconditionally. How about self-defense? So you take out the trash and I'll love you. And you do this and you do that. I'll love you. So we, we put guilt on each other. Yeah. It's a debt, a debt uh, conditional love. Where I'm a dad, you your dad for me, you know. But that's not at all what we're looking for. But that, those are all good answers. But the whole thing is so simple. It's one little word. It's a commandment. Self self. Yeah. Self self. Self A M I L I A R I T Y. Familiarity. What happens when you get to know you with a wife over the years and a husband over the years and your preachers and your teachers and your fellow church members every Sunday morning Sunday night, Wednesday night. Look, I enjoy fellowship. I need fellowship. And a lot of people say, well, you, you can have too much fellowship. How do you love? Because in every fellowship there's somebody that needs me. And I'm here to give myself to somebody in this place who needs me I may get familiar with all you people. You may get bored with me, and I might get bored with you, you know? I mean, if you could just see what I see. You know, when I first started preaching, I went to Tommy Zarr's farm. And he said, what are you going to do? So I'm going to be a preacher. He had a real neat row of cabbages. They had cabbage heads out in his backyard. And I lined up those cabbage heads, and I pretended they were pews, and I preached to those cabbage heads like as if they were church members. And I've been preaching for them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but you know, familiarity shouldn't breed contempt, should it? <clears throat> Familiar? You've got to love me even when you see my faults, my problems, my hang-ups. And I've got to love you when I see your faults. Your problem. You know, I like what Doug said, and, and this is a this is the clincher to the whole thing. If you love, you have a knowledge of the whole universe. And James 1 verse 12, read this for us. James 1 12. Come on now, read it real quick. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You have a crown of life. I told you you had eternal life. You have a crown of life. You have eternal life. Back in 1962, I read an editorial. They had just discovered DNA. The nucleolic acid in the center of the cell. They said, wow, what a remarkable discovery. And one Russian microbiologist said, we must not sleep this DNA. This is eternal life. We have discovered the secret of eternal life. That was back in 1962. Where's that microbiologist at right now? Yeah, he's dead. He's gone. Look. Who has discovered eternal life? It's not in DNA. The love of God perfected in you, bringing joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory. You have discovered the secret of eternal life. You already have it. Isn't that something? 
and you need to enjoy it. You need to live it out to the fullest. Uh, in Doug Hartman's sermon, he concluded it with this point. I like this. He said, there was a guy who was going to set a record for swimming. And he got into the channel with a nice safe of swimming. The boat was on the side. He swam for 15 hours. And after 15 hours, the boat's alongside him, looked over at him, he looked up at him, and he said, I can't go on, I just can't go on anymore. He said, come on, you're about ready to break the record, you can do it. And he said, I can't. He said, I'm finished. And so, they finally had to surrender, and pulled him out of the water, and when he got up in the boat, he looked out, and he saw the shoreline about half a mile away. And he cried. He said, if only I could have seen the shoreline from the water, I would have kept swimming. You see, you have to come on. Don't lose sight of heaven. I live in the light of heaven. And when I look to heaven, I can keep on pressing on you. You love God. You have joy unspeakable. You have a power. You have an inseparable relationship. Now next week, we're going to be a very powerful lesson. It's about our weaknesses and God's strength. You will love it. <laughs> be here on time. Be here with the Bible. Be here with a prayer. Amen. Pray the Jesus and our closing prayer. <laughs> you can do it. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here tonight uh, to learn your word and